Being the first uh, to climb a mountain has always seemed very exciting to me. Climbing for me is totally creative. It is an art form. It's quite a complicated game. Am I going to panic? Is it going to feel absolutely horrible? And it's harder to keep your composure. I think what happens with mountaineering and expeditioning is that it gets under your skin and you can't quite shake it off. What if we actually didn't just push that a little bit harder and ah! take it to our limit? Wouldn't we be further sort of dissatisfied? Because that's where all the interest is in going where no one's gone before. I feel lucky to have been sort of climbing uh, as, as long as I have done and uh, been through the 60s. Why do you bother climbing? Why do you climb? Uh, all I could think of saying was, well, I get grumpy when I don't. <laughs> We savoured our moments and driving around in old vans and... Mostly hitchhiking. I, mean, I didn't get a car till I was about 26. Kipping and dossing here, there and everywhere. And Luckily, one of the lads had his father's old um, tow rope, so we, we used that with the, the sort of grit embedded in your hands and the lichen and smelling it. And... I mean, the excitement was intense in those days. You know, it was a real uh, hothouse atmosphere, really. I remember uh, Pete Crew and um, Pete Hutchinson's uh, The Down Empire. You know, we all had uh, early duvets. I'd say, right, Pete, I want a sleeping bag. I don't want it to weigh any more than one and a half pounds. But I want, want it to keep me warm in, you know, minus 20. He started off uh, manufacturing them in this sort of chicken hut um, down in, near Broadbottom, which, uh, which I, I stayed in for a, for a few months. The world was opening up. Things which had seemed impossible before suddenly they were there to be taken. First of all, you know, expanding to the Alps and then to the further ranges and actually going to the Andes and to the, to the Himalayas. The Atlas Mountains, Tibestian Chad, Turkey and Iraq and Hindu Kush and all that. It was a sort of nomadic existence. We felt we'd arrived. I don't know why I got into big wall rock climb, I say. I had this uh, crazy thing about seeking out the biggest overhangs. Somehow I was trying to see if I couldn't come to terms with the exposure, but I never really could. If you get to know somebody who is really good, you perform much, much better. And Doug Scott, he was a very good climber. I just knew that he had done a very difficult route on the Jimmy West. I always was able to meet the best of the best. It was Scott, later on it was Messner. I was stunned by, by the Yosemite, especially, you know, this El Capitan and then Half Dome and the Leaning Tower. A lot of it is still that same old natural curiosity, just to see how it is up there. And with Doug, I, I had the possibility to climb the, the Salate route. 38 pitches of the finest rock climbs in the world. I believe there were only four pitons on, on these 900 metres. We were both intimidated, but by taking it one day at a time, we eventually sort of nibbled away at it. You could, if you train hard and if you have good companions and good friends, you go anywhere in the world, you know. On pushing your own personal limits, what's always fascinated a man most is the unknown. I've always been inspired by challenging looking peaks, Cheratori, Changabang, Trango Tower, things which are um, going to provide difficulty and a technical challenge. Annapurna was my first and first Himalayan uh, expedition. In those days, there was, there was absolutely nothing, you know. I mean, you could, you could cycle around Kathmandu and hardly see a car, you know. It was just amazing. Chris Bonington, he managed to get a, a picture of the south face of Annapurna. Uh, it seemed like a, a magnificent objective to have a go at. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a big deal at the time. I mean, it was one of the very first 8,000-metre peaks which had been you know, climbed by a, a hard route. Uh, it's just that you were climbing in, in surroundings which um, were far more intimidating, the, the, just the sheer size of it and the, the altitude as well. You know, it was a sort of a breakthrough, really. It did seem that that was the start of a new era of, of Himalayan climbing. Everest 75, the southwest face, you just felt you were part of something much bigger than yourself and it was just amazing.
you know, out there on a limb going for it beyond the end of the fixed ropes and being there with Dougal who was at the top of the game just during your partner swinging leads and when all the clouds were forming and billowing out but we only got, went down 100 metres vertically from the summit and um, had to bivouac it was a big step into the unknown no oxygen left so we dug a snow cave and spent the night in that and survived it well that really did widen the range of what and how I might climb in the future you only tend to talk about your successes. Four goes at K2, four goes at Nangaparaba, four goes at Makalu. Never got up on a failure. More interesting things happen. Yeah, you've quite often gone to your limit and learnt more about yourself. When things get to get difficult and, and dangerous, then you go beyond any frontier. Now we have to give our best. The human experiences you make on your limit, and each of us has a different limit. Uh, Doug Scott and Dougal Heston, they needed Mount Everest because they were the strongest climbers then on, on, on Earth. So they had to go high. We had a certain evolution in mountaineering. Uh, we were trying only to climb Everest without oxygen to have later on a chance, a possibility to do the next step in the Himalayas. Lightness is one of the major things in, in alpinism. I was never uh, anybody who wanted to have a lot of people on the expedition. I wanted to do it more elegant. I wanted not to use oxygen. But we were a little bit afraid about Hillary's step. There were no fixed ropes, no uh, footsteps, nothing. But I could see me climbing up, fighting, fighting. The summit was there. We could see it. We could see the tripod. And uh, we knew we can do it and we crawled up on knees and, and hands for the fact that the storm was so strong. Everything went to pieces because you are you, you're happy, you, you cry, you laugh, you, 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 you... I remember him sort of shaking. Uh, if there is on one uh, side death, on the other side uh, life, the art of great alpinism is going exactly between it. Classical mountaineering would never be forgotten because this is giving us the possibility to understand how doubtful, how small, how crazy we human beings are. To me, it's just that ongoing love affair. I fell into it as an adolescent and never fell out of it, even though it nearly killed me. And I think it was definitely my mind willing this puny body to do what it didn't want to do. And, and that's very rewarding, and, and we all have it in us. Anyone can do it. It's just whether you actually make the decision to do it. You've got everything going against you to make a successful ascent. The wind had, had unexpected effects. Um, it blew across your mouth, it blew into your face, and you couldn't breathe properly. The only way I, I eventually managed to catch my breath was to stick my head in, into a crevasse. We spent uh, seven days pinned down in the ice cave on the low lar, unable to get out because of the high winds and the really cold temperatures. And when eventually the weather cleared a little bit, we could hardly walk. We'd reached our limit. Uh, I suspect that if we'd pushed further and higher, somebody would have died. These are probably some of the worst conditions that man has had to survive on Earth. The challenges were changing very, very rapidly, and we were part of a revolution to move onto these steep faces to climb them what was called alpine style, starting at the bottom and continually ascending these routes till we reached the summit. And it was humbling as well, I remember, going, uh, well, the Olga 2 trip. Bang, you suddenly floored with the Himalayas. I found that desperately hard, thinking I've got everything to relearn, that this pure style had a right to exist in a way. Broad Peak, yeah, first 8,000 metres. That calm hour on the summit with perfect weather, seeing the curvature of the earth all around us and everywhere, and that was something. It was like being in space. An officer grandeur has to walk a spur. If I could obviously solo it and on site, that's what it's all about. I just love the idea of, like, dare I go and do that? I felt like I needed a big experience climbing such a route. That sensation of being so pleased with the way you climbed that you know you produced the best of yourself at that time. It's, it's just pure selfishness, stylistic perfection. I love the glow you get from it afterwards. I love the intensity of the action, you know. Soloing's all that. 
No, it didn't feel lonely because you're carrying with you all your memories, all your thoughts, all your friends and family and all the people who've made this possible. All that day I was sort of crossing barriers. I was at my absolute physiological limit. It, it took me 16 hours to get to the summit. We're just there alone in this silent white space. When I was coming back from the summit, it was getting dark. This is crazy. I probably pushed myself harder than I ever had done before. At the back of my mind, I think I always thought I might end up having to spend a night out in the open. I made sure I could lie out full stretch, and it was grim. You're treading this dangerous edge. A sort of momentum takes over, and that's the wonderfully liberating realization. I knew it is possible to survive. I think it keeps giving adventure stuff, that is, and I do it mostly probably to put myself in touch with myself, actually. It's a sense of freedom, it's the freedom to wander, to travel, to try and be creative. What a surprise, we had a great day, a big buzz amongst my friends. I thought, well, yeah, this is really neat, sharing something. I suppose we all are all escapists, aren't we, in a sense? I think a lot of it is to do with new horizons. There are things that we can do now that they couldn't do a hundred years ago. It was the moment of truth. We were taking off into the void. We knew not where we would end up. We knew not what would happen to us. It was a very stressful moment. It was a wonderful moment too. increased dramatically in size as we flew directly towards the summit. It enlarged and enlarged and enlarged. It was enormous. My instruments were saying that we were going to get up and over the summit of Everest, but my instincts were very doubtful about that. Station, this is Starfly 1. We're just crossing Everest now. Um, does anyone copy? So I feel that there are days you know, where I feel like, well, no, I don't want to leave this safe point now. And uh, But there are other days where I don't think so much about it, and then I just go for it. The rewarding thing is that I live the moment. If I'm too intense on work, when there's deadlines, I can't just switch off and go solo in the mountain, that's too dangerous. I need to focus and be free in my mind to be able to do things like that, and that's why I like expeditions. There's no distractions. When you are pushing the limits of your endurance, it, it does concentrate your mind. All your life becomes so focused, and it does have the effect of, of calming that inner chatter. I've got three seconds to figure out which is the hold I'm going to jump for, um, and I'm going to take those three seconds, I'm going to make the right decision, and then it's going to be fine. You don't just need to have the, the mountaineering skills of being a climber, being able to handle yourself on, on crags and mountains and being really confident and you know, having good composure in all those different situations, but you need to have a high level of fitness on top of that. That's the difference to the hard climbs today, is you can't really just turn up at the crag all the time and pull it off. Physical difficulty, right up at my limit. Psychological, can't get away with falling off, risking your life. Perfect claim for me. It's a game of moving one body part at a time, never getting ahead of yourself, always staying really, really in control. You've got this interaction when you're climbing. You're trying to understand one rock type or one type of terrain. It's like ice or snow or rock. So you gain yeah, knowledge and understanding of it until you become Expert at it. Nice one. I want to be nowhere else but here right now. And then you do it and it just feels really perfect. Yeah, follow the seam, Dave. The more problems I come up against, the more I kind of wean into it. But at the same time, that's what's got me up all the hard routes that, that I've done for sure. Risk is, has its own value for its power. The escapism of climbing has its own value in simplicity. parts of the world that are the most special and the most rewarding to see just happen to 
involve a bit of hardship and hard graft to get there. Look what I do, I eat lettuce and, <laughs> and do little exercise other than, you know, a, a catwalk runway. I can't, hey, why don't we go and walk the Great Wall of China? It was pretty much an immediate end to the world of modeling. Just generally walked all day for six months. There were good days when we may do 40, 45K. There were days when we only covered one. I actually lost an inch in height during my uh, journey because of compression of the spine from my pack. Most of them had never ever seen a Westerner, um, let alone a you know, six foot blonde coming at them in a pink suit. It was quite a shock, you know, it really was an alien landing. As much as you feel elation that it's finished, you can still vividly remember the pain you've gone through. But the speed in which that pain disappears from your mind is amazing. You know, within a week, I would start all over again. It was the best thing I ever did. At one point I realized, well, I think I can do it. I knew I had the power to climb it. Why don't you climb it? You know, and I thought, no, uh, Heinz, you don't need this much fear. I don't feel like free soloing this route now. I felt myself kind of going into this route in my mind already. It was strange because the fear, which always was there, it completely disappeared and next was a strong feeling of calmness inside me and then a very strange feeling of joy rose inside me. Then I kind of woke up and thought it's crazy you, you did not climb it. I was still sitting in front of the route. And then I climbed it uh, without any strong feelings. I felt almost nothing. I felt no gravity. There were no thoughts of fear or danger. Or... But I was there, looked out, and thought, yeah. When you suddenly realize that this is it, the next sort of five seconds, you're either going to do this amazing climb and you feel the pressure of that, uh, or you're going to take this big fall. <laughs> The mountain, to me, never has been an enemy, never. The mountains let me live. If you're an expert at climbing one place, it gives you that great feeling of a connection to it and confidence in it, so you feel really at home and feel like you can do something really good. And I just love that feeling. There are also all these other hardly known mountains. There are many peaks in the Himalayas that have not even had a second ascent or even a first ascent. There are whole areas of Antarctica that are still unexplored. You stay sharp. I just miss it if I'm not doing it, you know. I've got to climb, you know. Just got off safely. I just stayed in the tent and save at the moment. Feeling clear-headed, feeling my strength come back, feeling so much at peace with myself. I just don't think there's any better feeling than that. Each generation has the chance to reinvent climbing. You have to find new approaches. And there is still everything there to invent and reinvent climbing. Classical alpinism in touch with creativity will never die.